ladies and gentlemen. I have Andrew Baker from Leatherwood Bespoke Rosin, and he, we are actually talking. It's it's a day ahead for you because you are in Australia. I'm in Massachusetts on the east coast of the United States, and uh, you, you're kind of this is surreal for me. You know, it's really really great to be able to talk to a rosin maker and someone who's passionate about rosin making. Andrew, how how are you doing today? Yeah. Uh I don't know whether to say good morning or good evening. It's morning for us here and it's um, it's Wednesday and I think it's a Tuesday night for you perhaps over That's there, but I uh, know we're doing well over here and um, I'm very pleased to be a part of the violin podcast. Thank you for, for the opportunity. Well, I mean, I've, I don't know if you know this, um, you know, we just, we just met for the first time, but I'm actually quite obsessed with rosins. You know, I've tried very various rosins from like Pirastro. Um, I saw the leather with bespoke rosin. I, be, I believe I, the, how I heard about Leatherwood Bespoke Rosin was like, I think I was scrolling through Instagram at one point. I'm like, wow, that looks really quite nice. Like the picture and the color of the, of the rosin. Like I was, I'm also kind of obsessed with like the color. Um, and there are like various different kinds of rosins that I hope that you would be able to talk about with our listeners. Cause a lot of our listeners are beginner violinists. Uh, some of them are pretty advanced. Um, demographic is kind of all over the place, but I want to get to know how you started making rosin and what interested you in the first place. Do you have a, a string playing background? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a violinist, performer and teacher um, through my whole life. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, so I, I was you know, playing and teaching background. In fact, I was the head of strings at a conservatorium of music out here in this, this region where I am. And um, I, I've been a total accessories geek my whole playing career, you know, rosins, shoulder rests, tail pieces, strings, you name it. Once you, you become know, a violin teacher though, like that's like your life. You know, I feel like I've, I, you know, my half of my violin case is just like full of accessories, like finger tapes, you know, <laughs> the whole, yeah. the, the line finger tapes and everything. Exactly. All that, all that sort of thing. So, um, but I, um, I started the rosin journey because actually I was, I was skeptical about rosins. I thought, and, and actually the, the real reason to be honest is I kept dropping and breaking my rosins and I kept, and I thought, I just can't stop. I can't keep buying these things. I have to just make it at least, you know, and try and save a bit of money. So, um, yeah, so honestly, I, the, the rosin budget can get really expensive, honestly, like, yeah, um, especially like, you know, if you have a good kick of rosin and then you're like, Oh, it's just broke. I can't believe it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, you can drop your shoulder rest um, a thousand times and it won't break, you know, but the rosin does. And that's a, so that was my frustration. So I wanted to just, I started to buy some ingredients and experiment. And I thought if I could just make something as good as the stuff I use, then fine, I'm happy. But actually I discovered that experimenting with different ingredients, the sound and the response characteristics with different rosin ingredients changed significantly. Um, so I was, I was able to make, let's call it my best recipe for myself. You know, I found something that I really liked. And then I tried it on my other violin, which is completely different in sound. And it didn't sound good at all. Um, so I had to make something for that as well. And then that's when the idea came to me that of, of customizable recipes in, in that we should, we should have rosin recipes that are more customizable for the individual person. I think, yeah. That's great. And that's the whole bespoke part, right? Where you have a certain uh, characteristics of like what the player wants and then like, okay, well, I want a little bit more grip because I'm playing this kind of repertoire. What can you offer me? Is that essentially what the business model is? That's, that's exactly it. So if you rang me and said, I, I play on a Stradivari and I have a, a French bow and I'm a second violinist in an orchestra and they tell me I'm too loud. I need to blend in more with my sound. You know, we can make a rosin that will, um, will, will, will move towards those characteristics. We'll sort of help that, I guess. Uh, so, so we've made hundreds and hundreds of recipes for people now. Like there, there are so many, there are lots of recipes that are quite common now, but there are also some that are incredibly unique. In fact, we just had a client recently who, I think lives in the States, um, but has Chinese background and plays the Erhu, you know, the, the Chinese traditional uh, violin. And we made a re the really specific recipe for her and that, that would make her particular instrument sound the best it can, um, not only in clarity, but in terms of she wanted more warmth and depth in the sound because she had a, hers maybe was slightly bigger than the normal, it had a slightly deeper sound. Maybe it was the viola, 
of the air who world or something like that so yeah so that that's what we do we spend a lot of time talking to people um and, and listening to about what they're playing how they play what sort of instrument they're using what sort of sound they want to make and then we create the best rosin we can for that yeah that's really awesome i you know for the listeners listening at this point we're talking about like really micro adjustments to the sound i i believe in, in my view you know you can have a good bow you have like really good Mongolian white horse hair for your violin. And then the moment you have a good rosin to put on that hair with great strings and a good sounding instrument, then the world changes. Like the musical, the, the musical possibilities that you have is, is just to me, like endless, you know, like if you have a good cake of rosin, you know, that can kind of do a little bit of everything that to me is like really, really um, special. Can you, tell a, I mean, without revealing much of your recipe can you just tell talk about the basic ingredients of what rosin is because it seems like everybody has these secrets you know like you have like baker's rosin yeah. which you can get like in, you know in florida like once you know if you i don't know if people who are listening there's this rosin in florida i mean i'm grateful to have that rosin but you know you have to be on a waiting list for like three years and i'm actually glad that i'm talking to you because you don't have to be on a waiting list to get your rosin, which, you know, thank you so much. Um, but can you talk about the basic ingredients and um, yep. you, you, about about rosin and um, how you kind of approach rosin that way? Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously the main ingredient is pine, pine resin, uh, the sap of pine trees, and the resin has to be distilled. So it has to have the, the tar and the oils evaporated out of the rosin and there's there's many ways to do that so there's some more traditional ways and also some more advanced um mass production chemi um, um factory kind of ways to do it so i mean what we do is we we buy um resins from lots of different countries and resins that the resins that have been distilled in lots of different ways so the method of distillation has an effect and also the degree to which it's been distilled has an effect so you can sort of stop the process at some point rather than go all the way. And um, I'm not a chemist, so I can't tell you chemically why, why they di differ, but I know that on the on the violin string, all of those different variations make an impact into the sound and the response. And so what we do is try and get resins from all over the world uh, to, um, you know, to, to be able to have more options to affect the sound and response. Um, it's, it's pretty much, you know, only pine resin is the ingredient, um, a little bit of wax of some kind. Beeswax is a really common ingredient in there too. And actually, you know, different beeswax affects the sound. There's also lots of different oils and waxes that can be used um, as well. And generally what the wax does is soften the, the rosin a bit. So it's not, not so um, brittle, not so hard but also depending on the, the wax you're using and, and how much of it you use, it also affects the stickiness um, of the rosin. So generally, for example, a double base rosin will have more wax in it because it actually makes the rosin a bit stickier. So that's one of the ways that, that something like um, Pops rosin or, or our Amber Range rosin, you know, makes, makes something really, really quite sticky. Do you have a favorite rosin that you've made? I can't, I can't, I'm just thinking back at that moment for you where you're like, oh, this is the recipe. Like, Eureka, this is the yeah. recipe that I'm going to use for myself. Like, how did that feel? Yeah, it was great. It felt wonderful. And actually, the recipe was the one that we uh, sell quite commonly now. It's called the supple recipe. So it's the one that, one that has a warmer, richer, deeper sound and a, and a thicker feel on the string. So that was the one I really loved and I used for a long time. Now myself, I'm using a 65% a supple, 35% crisp mix um, just because of my particular instrument at the moment and the, the strings. I'm using um, uh, Tomastic Rondo strings at the moment, which I'm really enjoying. And that recipe I love the Rondo well. strings too. I, I, yeah, I use a I use a rondo strings too, and, and actually I I'll probably have to talk to someone from Tomasic in Fell as to why they don't make it mainstream. I think it's part of the Luthier series. I, I think, think that's yeah. I think that's the reason why. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's right. Um, so, but I'm also changing strings all the time, so I'm changing rosins all the time as well now. And actually, we've re recently just received some new resin ingredients we've never used before to develop um, new new recipes for products that will come out. 
um, sometime soon. So it's, it's a never ending journey and, and it hasn't finished in terms of what recipe can be made. And, and always in the back of my mind is, I think we can make something better still. You know, we haven't reached the, the high point yet, I think of recipe creation. I think that's phenomenal. And I think it, you, the business, your business actually is quite new. I mean, it started just a few years ago, in my, if, if I'm not mistaken, right? How long ago did you, well, let, let's, I, I would love to know and for the audience to know, like how long ago was that first supple rosin recipe that you made? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, maybe I can turn this into a business and I could actually sell this and try to create, you know, some, yeah. some, you know, some viral content regarding it and then sell it. Well, how long was that? How long did that take? Yes. So look, um, we, we launched the business onto the market publicly about five years ago. Um, in fact, probably five years ago this month, probably our five year anniversary now. Oh, well, congratulations. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And um, I, I think maybe that first supple recipe was created about six years ago, perhaps. And I think um, I started developing the I idea. So sort of, so not the idea of the business, but developing the idea of making rosins about maybe seven years ago. And that's also while I was still teaching and performing as well. So it was kind of just going on, you know, on the weekends and, and after work. So um, yeah, it is, it is quite, it is quite new and it, we've only been here five years. So it's been a fun journey. Yeah. What are some of your favorite repertoire to play with your rosin? Because you said it's a supple rosin. Is there like any specific kind of composers? Are you like a new music person, or what kind of what kind of music do you usually play? Yeah, I've played. Um, I I've played um, a whole range of repertoire. I love everything. I actually did in my study days at university a specialism in um, Baroque performance, historical performance practice, and actually we've developed Baroque recipes, and um, I sort of used more of my knowledge to really help that process and, and my, my colleagues in the Baroque community here in Australia to help develop that. Um, you know, for the supple recipe itself, one of the pieces I played a lot to really develop the sound characteristics was the, the opening of the first violin part of um, Samuel Barber's Adagio for, mm. for string, or string quartet. Um, Cause that, that's really what I was trying to say. What do, could, could we make a recipe that when you're playing so softly and so slowly, you know, do you really have great control over the, the 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 grab or the connection to the string and control over the sound colors? You know, can you you find a deeper color if you say come slightly closer to the bridge or you know move further away from the bridge? So that was a really important important piece. Also, something um, heavily on the G string, like say the opening of Tigan or Tigoinovise and those kind of works. Um, for our crisp recipe, the other one. I was really focusing on the opening of the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. There's nothing, um, the E minor, there's nothing that's uh, more clear on the E string really, you know, and exposed. And that was really about obviously having really a good clarity and really precise attack on the string, but also reducing as much surface noise as possible. So as much hiss, which was, which was important. And I think our crisp recipe does that quite well. That's something that I actually wanted to talk to you about is the, the bow noise. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about um, the relationship with the bow hair and the rosin and how much bow noise you can get. I feel like right now we're getting to like the, to the various big, like minor specifics mm. and adjustments right now. But um, I know for me, like in certain, certain strings, like dominance, dominance for me, I'm not a fan of like regular and dominance. And I know that Tomasic Intel just really dominant pros I haven't tried them yet, but dominance to me tend to have like this very, um, rusty kind of sound under your ear. And of course it's not like that when you're out in the concert hall, but how is that? Um, can you talk a bit about that bow noise? And is that something that you were trying to achieve with your rosins in general, like, and how you how you perceive rosin? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really big factor because it's something that uh, annoys people quite a lot when they're playing. And I think there's two things that, that influence the, the bow noise or the surface noise. Um, one is the, the, the type of recipe you're using. So, so some rosins have less bow noise and some have more, but also the other issue is the amount of rosin you have on the bow, the more dust that's there, the more noise you get. So one of our goals was to be able to create the sound we wanted with the most 
with as little rosin as possible on the bow. Um, so we're often educating our, our customers to use less, as little as possible to the point where you almost think you don't have enough. And actually that's where you get the nicest sound quality and the, the greatest reduction in bow noise. I think if you can see dust coming off while you're playing, you have way too much rosin on is too much. Definitely. And, what, and I know for me, I know for you also, I'm, I'm you know, allergies, like you don't want to be sniffing on stage and that's just the worst. I don't want that. It looks flashy, everyone. Like for people who are listening, if you're like a beginner and it looks flashy, like on, you know, music videos, having rosin go up, but it doesn't improve this, doesn't improve your sound. It's a myth. You know, if we're going to factor myth, this is a myth. Do you know, I remember a story from my childhood. I was, I was a big fan as a young violin student of Nigel Kennedy, the great English violinist. He's fantastic. He, I love him. Yeah, and he used to never, never clean the rosin off his violin. So his wonderful guanary was just covered in white rosin dust. And we used to think that was the coolest thing in the world. And we would try and make that same effect. We would not clean our violins because it was a sign that you were practicing more in our in our minds. You know, un until our teachers said, "No, you have to clean your violin and you have to get all this rosin off your bow and your strings." Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny that one, but, um, you, you're right. It, it actually less, less works best. Um, and you, you want to have as much hair in contact with the string as possible, I think, and too much rosin can get in the way of that. And then you have less control over the sound. It actually feels slipperier. Um, and you can have a really grainy or surfacey noise as well. Yeah. My general, um, tendency is to lean towards lighter rosins. Um, I know that there's like the Melos rosins from Greece and there's also um, some other like a Bernadelle rosin. I, for, to me, I think Bernadelle tends to be more on the dustier side, which is why I don't gravitate towards that too much. Um, but yeah, def definitely, I, I agree with everything you're saying, um, especially with the with the not the Baker's rosin that's from Florida, not your Baker's rosin, but the one that I'm 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 sure that you're pretty familiar with that one. Um, that yeah. you have to be like kind of no, no relation though, no relation. No, no relation. Yeah, no relation, which is um, quite great. But that's actually what they say. I mean, they have like a Cremonese recipe and they um, they they make their pine resin really fresh. In Australia, do you also have a recipe that you get the pine resin fresh? Like, do you have any tree sap that you can get fresh, like in a season to make the rosin? Um, no, not here. Now, we have the wrong uh, species of pine tree here in Australia. Actually, we do have some in the really north of Australia in Queensland um, that can produce some resin, and we have used that before. Um, it's there's no industry in Australia for producing pine resins, so um, it's it's sort of important. We, we we did manage to get some through an arrangement uh, through distilling it out of a byproduct of, of timber milling, um, but we actually just couldn't get enough of it, to be honest. Um, it was quite a, a tricky process, but um, and it's also where we live. It's it's too cold, as well, to have um, sap um, running smoothly out of trees as well. So, so we're we're getting ours from the from the countries that do produce um, the pine resin and and do distill it. Yeah, understandably. So thanks thanks so much for uh, for sharing all that. You said that you did a degree in Baroque violin. If I, if I heard you correctly. Yeah, well, it was a, I did a, a bachelor's degree at Sydney Conservatorium in performance. And then I lived in Amsterdam for three years. And I did, uh, I did a, a, a diploma that also had a, a, a focus on Baroque violin. So I did a, a, about two years of work. There's a Baroque great, violin. there. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but there's a great uh, Bach group in Amsterdam. Um, you may know of it, but I'm just such a fan of, um, of their playing and you know they use historical instruments and and whatnot um do you have any favorite baroque composers that you like or um yeah abs absolutely look um i mean i've played bach my whole life and i love the bach sonatas and partitas um i'm a really big fan of the bieber mystery sonatas or the rosary sonatas they're just yeah and i've performed them in a recital before you know and having to manage uh, scordature and, and changing strings and, and having two violins operating to make that easier, which was really, really great fun. Um, but at that point, you're, you're actually talking about, you know, using gut strings, right? 
So, yes. and then the resin yeah. that you're making are also, is also really different with the contact between steel core strings and gut strings. Yes, yes. So we make a, a Baroque recipe as well, which is designed for gut strings. And it, it has a completely different focus. So, so talking about surface noise, for example, is really, you know, string noise is really prominent on gut strings. And also if the bow doesn't quite grab the string, it makes a squeak, you know, which is a horrible effect. And um, so our Baroque recipe is designed to make the string vibrating, get the string vibrating so it won't squeak, but reduce as much surface noise as possible. And also the strength of the attack on the string is a lot less. It, you don't need the strength of attack that you do for a modern string. So, so we've had to change the recipe quite a lot for that, that particular thing. But our, I'm really proud of our Baroque recipe. It works really well actually on gut strings. Yeah. That's awesome. Approximately how long does, um, in your view, how long should rosin last like a full cake of leather with bespoke rosin? How long should it, how long should it last? How many times should you apply it and how, um, consistently should you apply for me personally? I, I apply rosin actually once every two days. I mean, I know I'm not performing as much cause I'm doing a lot of teaching and, you know, with the United States still kind of in limbo with, you know, the performances and a lot of freelancers are still trying to figure out what they're going to do with the performances. But anyways, I would love your view on um, how much to apply and how frequently you should apply rosin, especially your rosin. Yeah, sure. So we find, look, we say, I guess a cake of our rosin would last a performer two to five years. I think two years is realistic for someone who's playing very intensely and all the time. Um, five years for, I don't know, maybe someone who's not performing that regularly, maybe doing a lot of teaching, something like that, or, or say a student. Um, but I've, you know, I've met clients of mine who have one of the first rosins we've made, you know, five years ago, six years ago, and they're only halfway through the cake, you know, they're still going, going quite well with it. That's great. Um, we do say, you know, less, less is better. So why, because we have a long, thin design and you have a greater surface area of rosin touching the bow hair, you can move the, the rosin slower along the bow, which I think is really important. I think moving it fast heats up the rosin and makes it a sticky, gooey sort of thing, whereas slow movement keeps it cold and keeps it a fine dust, which is a much better result. So moving, and if you're doing that, we just say like two or three strokes and you're done. And I could, I could get through a day of playing on that. I wouldn't be rosining up again. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even think of the heat that you can apply with the rosin that didn't even occur to me. Like I know that with, I'm sure everybody listening, they have like the circle rosins and they have to like twist the circle and then they have to put it on, you know, yeah. like to make sure that the entire rosin is flat. That bugs the crap out of me. So I'm so, gl I'm so happy with your design. Your design makes yeah, sense. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, that's why we did it. And, and as I said, it, it had to feel nice in the hand. As I said, I keep breaking, dropping and breaking my rosin. So I wanted something that's easier to hold something that had more protection. So if you did drop it and crack it, it still holds it all together and you can still use it happily, um, you know, throughout its life. Um, but yeah, so it was interesting to discover that, that, that changed the way you apply the rosin onto the hair. Um, you know, so that's about it was slow, slow movement is better. Definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. I'll have to, I'll have to tell my students that because they do, they go crazy. They like what, like what we said before that more rosin, the better looks flashy, looks better and sounds better. But, um, yeah, I'll have to tell my students that do you, uh, in addition to making rosin is, is Rod making rosin now full time or do you still perform and do you still teach? What's your kind of, um, you know, violin life yeah like so look rosin is our full-time business we're a family business so my wife and myself uh work full-time and we also have one employee who who um helps with manufacturing and and also developing our products he's he's in fact his his background is as a sculptor and as a, a professional ballet dancer and um and modern contemporary dancer so he has this amazing um artistic mind and lateral thinking mind and so he's really really crucial in sort of developing new products and, and different ways of manufacturing things too which is great um so it's just the three of us and we work here at at where we live which is a, a 36 acre small um, farm you know in the um on the east coast of australia but but inland a little bit 
and um, I do I do play. I I run a community orchestra, an amateur adults string orchestra, and we rehearse every week and we play a few concerts a year and a a symphony orchestra concert once a year as well. And um, I, I don't teach really anymore. I do have one or two students who have a few lessons every now and again, um, but that's about it. I was actually lucky enough to play Beethoven's Violin Concerto. Uh, no, not last year. Well, it's now two years ago, COVID, of course, um, in, in, a, in a concert here, which was wonderful fun and a great way to sort of um, try and, you know, um, get my skill back to where it once was. Um, but now I'm, I'm really just playing with my orchestra um, for fun and really enjoying that. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I, I, I would love to touch a little bit on COVID since you mentioned it. It seems like Australia is like really back to normal. Everybody's out and about and, uh, you know, there's no COVID cases. Um, yes, um, we have been lucky, I guess. Um, maybe that's partly to do with Australia being isolated from any other country. Through, through water, also our popular, we only have 25 million people in the whole country. So there is in theory, a lot of space between people. I think that's an important factor. A lot of social um, distancing. Look, and our, our government, yeah, that's right. Yeah, our government has been quite strict about whenever there is an outbreak, there, there are lockdowns and there are measures put in place. And um, generally they, they get on top of it pretty quickly, but there's still a lot of frustration here because we can't travel overseas we can't have Australians returning home without them uh, quarantining. Um, and, and also our vaccine um, rollout is pretty, pretty slow at the moment because we just can't get access to, to what we need at the moment. So, but also we're, we're more of a low risk country. So I think it's probably going to be slower for us, you know, countries like America and, and others um, have a higher, higher need. In fact, I know there was a bit of a crisis in um, Papua New Guinea, uh, recently with outbreaks and a lot of the vaccines we'd received, we actually sent over there and sent um, staff over to, to administer the vaccines because their front of their frontline workers were just getting sick. So um, yeah, but look, it's Australia's a nice place to live during a pandemic, I guess, if, if that's the right <laughs> thing to say. Um, we've been lucky, but you know, we, we feel the effects of the world. The musicians, uh, you know, are not playing, well, they're probably starting to play now, but you know, a lot of a lot of the arts industry has been affected. Yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. If um, you know, that's the whole reason why I brought up COVID is to see what the what the performance industry is like um, in your area, especially with your with your orchestra and other orchestras around Australia. I know that for uh, you know, for the U.S., especially like the East Coast orchestras like New York Phil, Boston Symphony, they have, well, Boston Symphony has like the BSO now. So they're like trying to, a lot of orchestras now, like Chicago Symphony, Boston Symphony, are trying to kind of replicate what Berlin Phil have been doing all this time, which is digital concert hall. So it'll be very interesting to see where we kind of go from here and how yeah. quickly the rollout will be back into the concert hall. And that's that's something that um, I'm going to be very interested in, you know, speaking to you know future artists and um, people such as yourself. But I do want to transition, uh, Andrew, because we do get we we um, actually this is the first time on the podcast where we got questions in for the podcast, and I figured yeah. that I thought this would be a great opportunity to kind of uh, ask you some some of those questions. So we got questions in from Brenna, and what are some of your favorite historic violinists and why? Ah. Uh. Wonderful question. So um, I think my favorite of all time is David Oistrakh. Uh, my, my teacher was a student of David Oistrakh. Oh, no way. So, so he's, I kind of feel like he's my um, violin grandfather or something that I've never met. <laughs> um, Papa, Papa Oistrakh. Papa Oistrakh, exactly. <laughs> so um, look, look, I, I love his playing. Um, I love his sound. I love his approach. And of course, I've been brought up sort of in that style of playing. Um, I was lucky to have some lessons with Zaka Bron, also myself, in, in that in that Rus Russian tradition, and that was a really wonderful experience. So I'm a big fan of the the Russian school players like Bengarov and Vadim Repin. Um, but having said that, Hilary Hahn is one of my all time favourites, um, and Sophie Mutter. I grew up as a as a major fan of, and actually we were lucky to see her perform in Australia. Um, about two years ago, she played Tchaikovsky here, which was, and I was there, which was a great concert. Um, and 
also there are some really great modern Baroque violinists. I really love Andrew Manzi in, in England, fabulous player. And um, yeah, but I, I think probably some of those, probably the Russian school is where it's at for me. Yeah. That's really great. Um, and this is kind of a personal question. I mean, we talked about Baroque violence and, you know, you, you, you kind of go into like the Oistrock and the Vadim Repin and the Maxim Van Graaff. Um, with big, heavy sounds. Are there any kind of modern composers or modern, like more modern than Baroque, yeah. like 18, 19, 20th century composers or pieces that you really are drawn to? Oh, absolutely. Look, you know, Shostakovich, Violin Concerto. Um, Which one? One or two? Uh, is it two, the sort of more famous one? I think the second one is more famous. Yeah, yeah. I think it's two. It's a lot of energy. Yes. Um, so the Shost yeah, I'm a big fan of Shostakovich string quartets. I've played a lot of string quartets. So I've done a few of the Shostakovich, um, the Bartok string quartets. Love it. Um, I love Bartok's music. Um, I haven't got much into the music of, you know, say compos composers like Alban Berg or that, that kind of school. Um, that's a tough sell. Second Viennese school sometimes could be a tough sell. <laughs> I, so I don't, I think it requires two lifetimes. I think in my second lifetime, I'll, I'll go down that path, but um, there's still so much to enjoy. Uh, cert certainly in the late romantic, um, early contemporary period. Yeah, I'm a big fan of a lot of the composers, yeah. That's great. Well, Andrew, I, I had such a blast talking to you and geeking out about rosins. I mean, I feel like if anyone is the person, you are the person to talk to about it. Thank you agreeing to come on the Violin Podcast. And if you're interested in, you know, purchasing some Leatherwood bespoke rosin, you know, you can follow their Instagram page and go to their website. I'll leave all the links in the description, the podcast description notes. So go ahead and check that out. Um, and also, you know, leave some leave some questions for future episodes of the Violin Podcast. You know, we are always trying to get very interesting questions for from our listeners to our guests. So, and uh, Andrew, thank you for kind of being our guinea pig for the first time and you know answering one uh, one of our listeners' questions. So that's really really awesome. Thank you so um, much for the opportunity. It's been a, been great chatting to you, and um, and I love I love sharing my story about rosin. I'm I'm the total rosin geek, and I kind of know deep in everyone's heart who plays plays a string instrument we're all rosin geeks and it's absolutely a nice, nice levels to connect on and um yeah thank you again for the time i really appreciate it it's an honor thank you